Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to see so many uh, of you with us uh, today in our event about documenting human rights abuses and transitional justice in Syria. My name is Reem Turkmani. I am the research director of the Syria Conflict Research Program based at, at uh, LSE. The conflict research program uh, covers the conflict and its drivers in five different countries. Syria is one of them. And we are very privileged at this program to have academics, including the head of the program, Professor Mary Calder, who have experience from many other conflicts, uh, especially on the relationship between the documentation and transitional justice. Uh, when we were setting up our research plan at the beginning of the program, it was Yavor, one of the co-authors of the paper, who raised a very important question based on his experience on documentation in the Balkan. He said, yes, well, we all hear that the Syrian war is considered the most documented conflict in history, but is this documentation really paving the way for justice. So to answer this, we teamed Diavor with um, a Syrian researcher with a very uh, uh, excellent experience on docu uh, documenting uh, human rights abuses in Syria. And together they uh, uh, planned and implemented this re research that they're gonna uh, present today. So we're gonna start our event today with uh, contributions from the uh, two co-authors, starting with Yavor Rangelo. Yavor is Assistant Professorial Research Fellow at LSE Ideas. He also chairs the um, the governing board of the Humanitarian Law Center based in Belgrade. And he also co-chairs the London Transitional Justice Net Network. Yavor has published extensively in the area of transitional justice, human rights, security, and civil society in a variety of contexts. So Yavor, we'll start with you. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Rim. Uh, just picking up from you, um, I think our main sort of question in, in, in uh, tackling uh, this, this work was, um, yes, there is huge amount of, of documentation, potentially unprecedented on human rights violations that are committed in Syria. But to what extent uh, is this documentation effort able to catalyze and support transitional justice uh, processes? And we were sort of interested in the full range of transitional justice processes. So those that uh, have to do with perpetrators, uh, criminal prosecutions, judicial mechanisms and non-judicial mechanisms that uh, emphasize and, and sort of focus uh, on, on victims that are about recognition uh, and redress, uh, such as uh, reparations and uh, also restitution of, of land and property. Um, we, we sort of uh, recognize the fact that different types of transitional justice mechanisms require different uh, kinds of documentation and also use very different uh, standards of proof. Uh, and, and that sort of led us to the investigation which, uh, which involved uh, uh, sort of mapping and, and analyzing the documentation uh, activities of, on the one hand, international actors such as uh, UN fact-finding and, uh, uh, and uh, bodies that uh, are involved in, in investigation uh, for the purposes of justice, uh, as well as international NGOs, but also uh, we conducted 15 interviews with uh, uh, civil society uh, groups, Syrian civil society groups, uh, in order to understand what they're documenting and, and for what uh, what purposes. So uh, the, what I will do is very briefly highlight a couple of our findings uh, and recommendations, uh, and they're all available in the report, our paper, which is the accompanying publication uh, for, for this event. And I think the first finding and sort of the good news in a way is that this, uh, 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 this, this research revealed that more and more actors involved in documentation are taking a justice sensitive approach. In other words, they're specifically documenting for transitional justice purposes. However, what we also found is that when they do that, it tends to be uh, in the overwhelming uh, majority of cases, it tends to be about accountability, it tends to be about uh, criminal uh, prosecution. And then the second and, and sort of related finding uh, is really about the fact that there are significant gaps in the documentation of human rights violations in Syria, which have important implications for these catalytic and, and supporting 
functions that documentation should play in any future transitional justice process. It's an, uh, we sort of group them in, in two kinds. One related to accountability. Uh, and, and here what we found is that most of the documentation uh, has been about uh, atrocity crimes, uh, abuses committed uh, either by the uh, regime or by ISIS uh, and other uh, extremist groups. And effectively, uh, 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 sort of uh, directing much less attention to uh, Syria-based actors that are not uh, in uh, one of these two categories, but also, and very important, I think, for uh, all of us studying conflict, external actors. Uh, the role of external actors in uh, uh, sort of directly perpetrating forces under their command violations is documented by some international actors, but we found very little evidence about documentation that can support aiding and abetting uh, liability of international actors, given the number of, sorry, external actors, given the number of external actors that have been involved in the conflict. Um, and the fact that international law provides uh, uh, for uh, liability for holding them accountable in situations where they have provided support to the warring factions with no knowledge that uh, these actors uh, may use that support for, uh, for committing uh, atrocity crimes. I think the, the aiding and abetting uh, aspect uh, and, and sort of documentation that can support future accountability processes for external uh, actors based on aiding and abetting liability is a particularly troubling and, uh, and significant gap. However, the most significant gap that we found uh, in the documentation efforts we reviewed uh, has to do with uh, reparative and restorative justice. It has to do with uh, uh, sort of non-criminal prosecution types of, of mechanisms, uh, particularly reparations uh, and restitution of uh, land and property. There has been a huge emphasis on sort of mobilizing and channeling resources and attention towards uh, documentation for, uh, for holding perpetrators to account, which is not matched uh, with uh, similar attention and resources uh, to directed towards documentation that can actually uh, make a huge difference in the lives of many Syrians. And I think this finding about reparative and restorative justice is important because other research conducted by others suggests that for many Syrians, uh, some of the most uh, pressing justice concerns and issues uh, 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 related to transitional justice that are real priority have to do precisely with these aspects. For instance, research on, on Syrian refugees in neighboring countries uh, that, who point out that issues around uh, housing, land and property violations are uh, the most significant sort of justice need for them and also a prerequisite for uh, refugee return. So uh, very briefly on our recommendations with these findings in mind, as you can imagine what, uh, what the sort of the focus of our recommendations really is about rebalancing the documentation effort. Rebalancing it within the accountability sphere by bringing uh, in more resources and attention and directing it to those, uh, those types of actors responsible for violations that are currently neglected, uh, uh, sort of non-regime and, and non-ISIS uh, Syria-based actors and external actors, including those who may be liable uh, for aiding and abetting atrocity crimes. And on the other hand, rebalancing the overall documentation effort away from uh, a sort of almost exclusive focus on, on accountability when documentation is conducted specifically for justice purposes and ensuring that more attention and resources again are directed towards documentation that can support uh, re reparative and restorative justice uh, and taking sort of seriously the concerns and the priorities of Syria, particularly around uh, compensation and restitution uh, of land and property. And then my final sort of comment uh, and something that we flagged in the report uh, is that actually there is evidence in the Syrian case that documentation can become a catalyst for justice and can support it effectively. And it comes from uh, universal jurisdiction prosecutions, a, a growing number of criminal prosecutions uh, based on uh, a universal uh, jurisdiction, primarily uh, uh, in Europe, that suggests that when, when uh, 
Syrian civil society groups and international actors together with, with uh, a sort of uh, like-minded, interested, sympathetic states uh, come together. And, and when the documentation effort is very focused uh, and the collaboration is strategic, it does end up bearing, bearing fruit. And what we do is we reflect on, on that lesson and, and invite others uh, so that the, the, uh, some of the emerging successes with universal jurisdiction prosecutions could be potentially replicated uh, in other areas of transitional justice in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Javor, and thank you, for, thank you for sticking to time. So it's time now to introduce our second speaker and co-author of the paper, Seema Nassar. Now, those who know Seema very well and know what she does uh, every day would introduce her simply with one word. She is a hero, a real hero. Uh, the more formal introduction is that she is a human rights defender who has worked for the last nine years in uh, particularly on the file of the detainees and disappeared uh, people in Syria. She worked in extensively in documenting uh, the violation of uh, human rights, particularly against women. She is a co-founder of ORNAMO for Justice and Human Rights Organization and uh, the WE Network, WE Network, which is a framework to create a safe environment for women, uh, human rights defenders in the entirety of the MENA region. So, uh, Sima, the floor is yours. Greeting, uh, everyone. Um, thank you, Rhi. Thank you very much for uh, this. Uh, and thank you, Lever, for your uh, input. And I would uh, like you to start uh, from where you ended. Uh, yes, the criminal prosecutions in Europe were are uh, a particularly great thing and uh, also consistent with the transitional justice because they support the narrative of victims and affected communities and validate, validate this, their experiences of injustice, which is very good. However, at the same time, the limitations of this approach from a, tra a, tra a transitional justice perspective are becoming apparent only a small subset of crimes and perpetrators are likely to be prosecuted in this way. Moreover, the delegation of cases for investigation and the prosecution may be more aligned with, with the interests of states uh, than with the interests of justice of the exercise of universal jurisdictions becomes another tool for pursuing counter-terrorism objectives, which prioritizes the prosecution of terrorism-related re offenses over human rights abuses. The risk of co-option of civil society actors and documentation looms large. Also similar tensions and risks can be detected in the inter interactions of Syrian civil society groups with international actors. Most of our respondents collaborate closely with UN investigative mechanism and the human rights bodies. These collaborations reflect the strategic choices of civil society actors about how to put their documentation to use. However, they also generate much frustration some of the frustration is about international actors acknowledging the, the violations but failing to stop them. There, the also, there is also a frustration uh, with the uh, ways Syrian groups are treated by some international actors. While they require a lot of details, scrutiny and the speed to report a situation, in return a little effort as made to protect those who do the reporting. In 2012, Razan Zaytouni wrote in her obituary to our colleague Hassan Azhari, who was checking the data for their center as one of his many activities. What is going to happen after documenting one name after the another and making the quest after another? I work as a grave digger who, bur who buries the dead while yawning and then display their obituaries at the Museum of International Organization. Why the international community is so keen 
on documenting the crimes and under its watch. Why does the international community care that much about the organi organizing and accuracy in monitoring the victims' groans and then implying them in numbers, dystonomies, and the tables? Can we imagine how frustrated she would be if she knew that this has been happening literally and not metaphorically for years as as exhibitions are held to display pictures of the bodies of Syrian tortured victims in international museums and not only the obituaries. Returning to the research, not to the challenge, challenges in it, but to the, to the available opportunities, I will address only one, perhaps not the most important for some, but it's my favorite. There is another opportunity, opportunity revealed in our research on, on civil society that concerns gender feminist organization organization with a gender perspective and organization led by women tend to be more concerned with the reparative and restorative dimensions of trans transitional justice and more effective in integrating them in their work. In fact, they are already doing important work to address some of gender biases evidence in ongoing criminal prosecutions in Europe. For example, they have used the, their access to a victims, witnesses, and evidence to ensure that investigation indictments are expanded to include previously neglected offenses involving sexual and gender-based violence. The emphasis of such groups on victim-centered and gender-sensitive approaches has the, has the potential to make important country contributions to future transitional justice process aimed at the truth telling, compensation and commemoration of the civilian victims of war, reconciliation and non-recurrence of rights violations. And unlocking that potential depends on strengthening the connectivity and communication between women's groups and documentation groups, as well as promoting gender mainstreaming in the documentation space. I would like to con conclude with an important recommendation that I would like to draw attention to with my limited allocated time. So I decided to talk about funding, which was mentioned in the paper as one of the challenges facing Syrian civil society. It seems that it has a very important role here. The process, the process of reviewing the documentary work is not easy at all. Any effort to improve and develop develop databases, saving, analyzing, classifying, genderizing, and dealing with data without bias is a very expensive process. The data is very huge, that is on the same magnitude of what has been happening in the past 10 years, and it requires core funding and a small army of people that work with a lot of faith in the, in the importance of this work. The, recommend the recommend recommendation is not only about guaranteeing enough resources of, of operate to support the civil society documentation effort that intended to, to catalyze and support the full stream of traditional justice processes and the mechanism, prioritizes, prioritizing women's and women's led group and encroaching activities that promote gender equality and sensitivity in the documentation space. But it's also necessary to reconsider the methods used by donors, the impractical displacement mechanism, the, difficult, the, difficult, the difficulties of transferring money inside Syria, for example, and many, many more. Actually, this entire research has a call to everyone to stand up and to try to make a difference. 
yes, we are very good and we are we are doing fine, but we need to do more and do better. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sima, and thank you also particularly for focusing on the distinctive efforts of the organization that are led by women or the organization that focus on uh, gender equality. Uh, we'll move to our uh, next panelist. We are very privileged today to have with us uh, Professor Ruti uh, Title, who is a professor of comparative law at New York Law School. She's also the co-chair of the American Society of International Law. Uh, which is an interest group on trans transitional justice and the rule of law. Uh, she's also a lifetime member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the author of several books in transitional justice and human rights, including uh, uh, transitional justice and humanities law. So, uh, Professor uh, Ruti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful opportunity to engage with the uh, LSC authors here, a longtime collaborator, Yavor Randolph and, uh, and Seema, uh, who both have done great work with this report. So I want to uh, focus on three points uh, coming out of, uh, of transitional justice studies uh, uh, that really uh, uh, show us uh, the sui generis nature of um, transitional justice in Syria and the significance of the recommendations of the report. First is the relationship of justice and peace here, and that is that we're talking about a conflict that has not ended, and uh, we are talking about justice before a peace deal. And so this inverts the ordinary relationship of justice and peace. Uh, if you think about Nuremberg, it's the 75th anniversary today of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Well, that was considered to be uh, the Allies you know, producing justice at the end of the war. This is not uh, uh, the case uh, here regarding Syria. And so it's more like the intra-conflict ICTY, the Balkans, um, the, uh, the agreement uh, regarding amnesties and justice between Northern Ireland and the UK, uh, Colombia, uh, the ongoing uh, questions uh, and uh, the, the recent peace deal concerning Colombia and the FARC. And I'll say a little something more about this later. So this is the question and the goal, uh, if we're talking about justice before the peace, is a sustainable peace, okay? And what uh, can justice contribute to a sustainable peace? And I'm really going Going to pick up on some of the themes that Yavor and Sima have already introduced. So the, the second point here is this question of, uh, again, the sui generis aspect, the, the fact that we're intra-conflict means that um, it, while ordinarily uh, it would be the state uh, that uh, worries about transitional justice, that produces legislation, that, uh, that uh, hears the claims of victims, we don't have that here. Uh, and, uh, and so we are in a, in a moment where uh, there are other actors and the report uh, very uh, uh, importantly, um, uh, uh, re very comprehensively studies these actors. Um, what we have today is a global approach to transitional justice. So we see transnational actors and subnational actors. So on the transnational actors front, um, I'm just going to highlight and say more, a little something more about them later, but you can think of the UN, the Independent uh, International Commission of Inquiry, uh, as well as the General Assembly uh, created mechanisms, uh, um, which is really coordinating all of, you know, a lot of these documentation efforts. Uh, notably, there's no tribunal, okay, and because of the, pol the political context of, of this question of transitional justice before the peace, we don't, we don't have that. Um, and, then, and then the subnational actors, we can talk about um, uh, civil society and so many organizations, uh, notable organizations involved. And then uh, the third, which the report brings out, is the role of other states and the, and the, the way we seem to have an, an international community community of concern that's coming out of the universality uh, jurisdiction. And so I want to say something about that uh, in just a second. The third that relates to both the, the, this inverted relationship of justice before the peace and the beyond the state uh, aspect of the of transitional justice race Syria is that there are going to be multiple goals. Uh, and I'm probably, you know,
know, if we think about a spectrum, transitional justice runs the spectrum, as the report reminds us, between, you know, a spectrum of retributive goals to uh, reparatory and redress, and one might add a forward-looking sustainable peace, okay, and, and non-recurrence of conflict. And so, uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot uh, to do, and often there may be competing uh, aspects to these goals. So what has happened so far? Uh, what we've seen so far is significant documentation, as the report brings out, documentation that has been uh, um, uh, coordinated and, uh, and, and connected to criminal accountability. And so we see the work of the Commission of Inquiry, as well as the work of the mechanism that is doing significant um, coordinating uh, the documentation by civil society. Um, and this is very significant without a doubt. Um, in fact, universality jurisdiction, which all what that means is that other states, uh, primarily in Europe, have, uh, have the power, legal power, to prosecute cases involving uh, Syrian perpetra perpetrators of crimes in Syria. And, and, um, and that, you know, in Germany, in France, uh, this has been significant. I think it points to the fact that there is a, an international community of concern, even if there isn't a UN established tribunal. And they have not only they have created a record, not only have they been able to indict and potentially exclude perpetrators from future political power, but they have been able to create a record. Uh, and because it's in a criminal uh, context at the highest standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. And you could arguably say that they have created a community of nations that are that have an interest in accountability in Syria. And this is at, the, at a time when universities Universality jurisdiction had really been waning, and so there's a resurgence of interest. Um, and that's uh, very significant, and it's opened the door uh, to other accountability uh, in, in the future. Um, but what the report uh, brings out is that there is other work to be done and a gap because, as mentioned, transitional justice involves um, really the conception of justice in periods of, of political flux. And you don't have political consolidation yet of, the, of a future in Syria. And what you have is, uh, and really the most uh, significant offense uh, um, that that uh, has implications for the future in Syria is forced displacements. Millions and millions, 11, uh, 11 million of uh, refugees and internally displaced persons. And so the question becomes, uh, yes, you, uh, we have, you know, significant progress uh, on three levels going after um, uh, defendants in these, uh, in uh, involving atrocious crimes, crimes against humanity. But there are these atrocious crimes um, and, and forced displacement uh, is among them. The, one of the, you know, the problems is how to document uh, for those uh, victims, uh, the many refugees and migrants, how to uh, move forward for a future for them that will involve uh, not just redress, but uh, re restitution of their land. Um, and for this, we need, and, and this is uh, absolutely critical for any forward-looking uh, political transition, uh, for sustainable peace, you're going to need this, this level of justice. And the question will be uh, how to move forward uh, here. And, and, you, and you know, now transitional justice is widely recognized to include economic uh, factors uh, and to involve uh, root causes. And so for a durable piece, and I uh, look here to uh, a very good example is Colombia. Uh, Colombia is on uh, the fourth year since the peace deal in Havana. And part of what they've been able to do is bring justice into the peace deal. And in particular, this, you know, we have a law, there's a law in Colombia about restitution of lands that were taken by paramilitary and the FARC. Uh, but this involves um, documentation. And for uh, some years now, uh, there have been victims groups uh, that are working to uh, document, uh, and this has become part of, of the import important uh, ongoing uh, issue of jurisdiction jurisdiction for the peace in Colombia. Uh, and so uh, this is a part of what uh, the report um, identifies as an important missing piece. And that is that for a durable peace and political transition in uh, Syria, there's going to have to be a need to attend 
to documentation of forced dispossession, forced displacement, often rising to the level of crime against humanity on an, you know, we're talking about ethnic cleansing, political cleansing, religious cleansing, and by quote unquote of the land. And, uh, and, and so uh, what is um, much needed is documentation of these, of these patterns. Uh, of these patterns of dispossession. And so, um, and this can be made a part of the future, uh, any future peace settlement, but what is important right now is that there be adequate uh, documentation in order to be able to restore land and property to uh, victims, but also to be able to move forward and to be able to assure uh, other, uh, the, the rest of, of society that there is going to be the possibility of a peaceful uh, political uh, transition. I would add uh, just at the uh, end, I'm concerned about, about my time here. I would just add that uh, in addition to these uh, elements, uh, looking to the future, and often transitional justice is thought to be about the past, about um, a more backward looking, uh, and even restoration has a past uh, uh, flavor to it. You know, not at all. Transitional justice is really about, you know, the connection of political transition to justice. And here we're ahead of the piece. So we need to think about also about the narratives being produced by uh, these documentation efforts, by the Commission of Inquiry, and, and here, for the future, for uh, the future of Syria, what narrative is being produced, uh, and the importance of truth and documentation to any possible shared understanding of what has been happening and of the uh, critical moment in, in Syria. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ruti, for a uh, very uh, rich insight and reflection on the results of the report. It raises very important questions. Uh, I move to our next panelist, uh, Salma Kahali. Salma is one of those brilliant uh, feminists who are leading Syrian organizations that uh, Sima spoke about. Uh, Salma has been, uh, for the last six years, um, uh, working as the executive director of Dawlati, which is a leading Syrian civil society organization working on inclusive justice, civic engagement, and campaigning with families and survivors of uh, detention and uh, disappearance. Uh, she also has 15 years experience uh, as a uh, 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 activist for uh, social justice um, uh, in the uh, MENA region. Uh, Sima, without further ado, the floor is yours. Salma. <laughs> it's okay. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting paper and very interesting discussion. And I'll just uh, maybe go on from where Ruti was, uh, had started and, and maybe continue on a discussion about um, documentation and the gaps, because I think that um, there's two parts to what Ruti was saying that I think very fit in very well with what, what I wanted to say first in terms of the fact that we aren't in a position to have a national transitional justice process. Many of the traditional mechanisms and tools and the ways we think about transitional justice are not available to us now. And Assyrian organizations that have been um, talking about the day after for nine years, you know, we have had to think about what is our role now. How do we work towards justice? What does that mean in the in the current moment? What are we documenting? What kind of networks, capacity building, groundwork are we laying for justice in the future? And what can we do to achieve justice in the nearer term? And um, you know, and that includes the do the documentation and case building file that you know, uh, or accountability and case building that um, the report discusses very much. There's also the work that has been going on um, with organizations supporting victims organizing and uh, organizing of, um, especially in the, uh, on detention and disappearance, but also um, beginnings of, of that kind of organizing um, on other issues. And then the third file, which is more the memorialization and then documenting towards um, memorializing the conflict based on, based on truth telling, based on including narratives that aren't um, highlighted uh, very much in the conflict. And I think, you know, this has been a moment where we are the last few years where we're trying to look at, um, at where those gaps are. And, and at all these stages, the role of uh, women and women-led organizations, um, you know, uh, has been important in trying to push for a more inclusive approach 
to uh, justice and a broader approach to justice. What counts as justice? What kinds of crimes are addressed when we talk about justice? Who is involved in that conversation? How are victims involved in it? And, and how are their needs integrated into any mechanisms um, that are developed? Um, and women-led, and um, the discussion I think about documentation is important not only um, in terms of what is what crimes are being documented or uh, violations. So it's, uh, I think in addition to the need to document, um, uh, so I think there's, you know, in addition to the need to document, uh, for instance, HLP violation, uh, sorry, uh, violations related to housing, land, property rights, there's also a need to look at um, how the how the documentation is done, who does it. So if, for instance, in the doc, in the discussion, in the documentation of issues such as detention, for instance, or um, um, we need more uh, gender analysis. Uh, we need to have uh, looking at uh, what are the docu what are the violations that are happening? How does this impact on women? How does this impact on women differently than it impacts on men? How does this then also, um, you know, uh, uh, how does um, how do we make sure that? that full scope of the impact of detention is being captured and addressed in any justice mechanisms that we are, we are talking about. Um, and I think that's something that women's, women uh, led and uh, feminist organizations have been working on is to really broaden that discussion, even on issues that are well-documented like detention, we are trying to address more fully um, uh, the gaps in that documentation. So whether that includes, um, the work that we've been doing with women sent uh, women led groups on the impact of, uh, for instance, sexual violence and sexual violence and detention on women, the economic impact, the political impact, the social impact, all of that. How does this impact? Uh, how does this feed into um, uh, the impact on victims and their needs vis a vis justice? What does justice look like for them? Uh, another another part of the work we've been trying to do as um, organizations such as you know whether it's Daulati, Bada'el, Women Women uh, Women Now, and many of our other organizations that are working on the ground, Starpoint, um, is also looking is also is to really um, work to make sure that these victims' needs are integrated into that discussion much more clearly and women's needs in particular. Um, uh, and as one more, uh, I just wanted to add one more kind of documentation that I think many of us are also embarking on and have been doing, and that is related to oral history uh, um, archiving. And there are several organizations, including Daulati, that have been trying to lead this kind of effort from the ground with communities, documenting the uh, stories of groups and um, marginalized communities, in particular women, um, and their experiences of the conflict. Um, and from that, I think it adds another layer of understanding of the crimes and the violations that have been committed, how they impact on communities and in women in particular. And then again, add a layer of how they understand justice and what does that look like uh, for them uh, locally, in their communities, in different circumstances, and I think these are all important kinds of documentation that feed into um, that feed into uh, then you know what kinds of mechanisms we create and what kinds of um, what what justice looks like. I'd like to take one example very quickly, if I have time, to of of an issue that we have worked on, and that is um, with with women now and with women in communities is the impact of detention on relatives of detained and disappeared persons, in particular their impact on women. And that has had the effect of, you know, documenting their stories and their um, testimonies um, and, and working with them to, first of all, be, you know, speak, first of all, acknowledging the impact of detention, not just on those that are detainees, but also on their families and on communities, how that impact is also gendered. 
Um, and then how, how can we uh, include those women in particular in the discussions on detention, in, the dis in, in decision making or in advocating for what are the priorities when we deal with detention. Um, it has, I, I believe, made a, you know, and I think it has made a, a, a big difference in how we discuss the issue of detention and really widened the scope and also um, really centered the, the main, uh, the, the victims and the main um, stakeholders um, in that discussion. And I think that has, you know, that kind of documentation, that kind of work has led to a market, um, a more inclusive approach to, to discussing this issue. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Salma. That's very interesting. Thank you, thank you also for highlighting and for working on really important gaps that not many organizations cover, such as the perception of justice and including the locals, especially women, in the discussion about justice. They are not just victims that we're documenting, you know, they have to be involved um, in the discussion. Uh, that takes me to our last panelist for today, Ibrahim Olavi, who is the founder of the Syrian Legal Development Program, uh, which is an NGO working on fighting impunity in Syria and the promotion of the rule of law. Ibrahim is also a barrister at the Gornica 37, which is an international uh, justice chamber. Uh, Ibrahim? Perfect. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you for uh, all the previous speakers and, and the excellent uh, report. Um, I'll share just a couple of quick thoughts um, um, on the kind of documentation that has been going on in the past in the Syrian conflict and perhaps a couple of kind of challenges moving uh, forward. It was always um, kind of surprising, you know, when we, when I grew up before the kind of Syrian conflict started, it was always that, you know, when we hear about previous conflicts that happened, that, you know, there was always this argument that we did not know and therefore we could not act. How could this have happened, you know? Um, um, the elder also used to look at the elders and they say, you know, we never understood the sever severity of, of, of uh, what was going on. Fast forward, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, and you get the Syrian conflict, which is, as has already been said, one of the most well-documented uh, uh, conflicts. So in the past, we did not know that much, and perpetrators got away with crimes. And now we know so much, and perpetrators are still able to get away with their crimes. So how did that happen? Um, and I have a couple of kind of theories uh, about why did that uh, uh, occur. Um, first of all, you know, it, 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 this is kind of a, a quote that is, gets attributed to so many different people about, you know, you kill one or two or 10 people, you might face a trial, end up with a life sentence. You kill 100,000, you end up invited to a peace conference. And so I think the perpetrators in, in, in Syria knew that, you know, for them to be able to crush this, they need to overload the system, not hide their crimes, overload the, overload the documentation, overload the crimes so that no one knows where to start Syria becomes confusing, it's just a war, just collateral damage, and therefore any prospects of kind of justice get put aside for just a peace deal that wants to end this, uh, 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 this misery. However, bad news for them, that the fact that this, the Syrian com conflict has been so well documented might mean more work for us, but it's still possible. And I think that's one of the main issues that a lot of Syrians felt. It's like, how could you not know what's happening in Syria? We've been documenting uh, 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 so much. They felt that the fact that they're documenting so much meant less work when it comes to advocacy and, uh, and pushing for policies and for accountability, which is, in my opinion, the opposite, because now you just have to navigate uh, 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 the system. Um, and so, for example, I'm part of the legal team that is advising the government of the Netherlands against their kind of torture action. And it was very easy just to use secondary data to start with when we were compiling the secondary data of how many torture reports that were put together by the Commission of Inquiry, by the Com Committee Against Torture, uh, the Treaty Body of the Torture Convention, by Syrian organizations, regional organizations, international organizations. It just requires someone to sift through it and to be able to kind of use it and say, have you read that report and, and so on and so forth, because there's so much documenting, a lot of people have you know, gotten lost uh, in, in all this detail, which is something that the late uh, kind of foreign minister of Syria has said, you know, we will drown them in the detail so they better know how to swim. That, and that's when the kind of Arab League observers were, were planning to visit uh, 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 Syria to kind of monitor what, what, what is happening. 
Um, the, the second thing is that I believe, it, it, you know, funding documentation and funding accountability is the sexy thing, uh, the apolitical, easy thing for governments to do, right? They were funding documenting and accountability efforts in 2011 and 2012 when they could have prevented what they then spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in documenting. With, because of the legacies of Iraq, because of the legacies of Afghanistan, because of you know, the Russian and like the proxy element of, of Syria, a lot of states felt it's easier just to you know, fund the easy things, the, the ones that people would not kind of you know, disagree on. Russia doesn't you know, disagree about fighting impunity, just disagrees as for whom. Um, and so use these kind of big slogans that, that we can fund when uh, instead they could have uh, uh, prevented. So talking about a little bit of, of the current challenges when it comes to, to, to documentation uh, or, uh, and the wider civil society that, that is documenting. And I'm just gonna point out uh, two. Um, so the first thing that we've seen is that because of the brutality of the Syrian regime and its allies, um, Syrian organizations which were not present prior to 2011 due to the kind of police state that Syria was run under, found themselves always reacting reactively to, to what is happening in Syria, right? First day you deal with pro protesters, disappearance, killing of protesters, using of aircraft, bombing hospitals, chemical weapons, force displacement, and you run out of breath trying to kind of, you know, doc document and deal with these, all of these conflict-related abuses. Now the conflict has calmed down. In the last six months, there's no, there have been no territorial shifts. And so a lot of these organizations that have been documenting First felt demoralized that because of all the documenting that they've done, nothing much has happened, but also kind of were like, what now? What, what do I do next, given the kind of conflict related abuses that I know how to document are no longer uh, existing. So there's an existential kind of crisis with a lot of Syrian organizations that for 10 or eight or nine years have been always, you know, reacting to the crimes committed in Syria and were not able to kind of think uh, uh, um, kind of proactively because people, they thought the international community would help. No Syrian would have thought that this would continue uh, uh, for, for, for so many years. And so it's important for these organizations to take a step back and that's something we're assisting them to do and say, okay, what is, that, what is it that I want to achieve in the long term, given that Syria now is a long term thing and drafting those strategies. Obviously, drafting those strategies is very difficult because, you know, to draft a strategy, you need to have outcomes and indicators and, you know, how do you measure your success in a deeply, deeply kind of concerning human rights, depressing, demoralizing situation, you know, and specifically that the organizations that continued to work until now are those who are trying you know, notwithstanding all the challenges that I just mentioned to kind of uh, 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 go on. The second difficulty that, 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 uh, that is there that needs to kind of be, be dealt with moving forward is the safe space to discuss, okay, we've documented so much, what is the next step? And that's particularly, you know, linked to what Salma has been talking about. The, the, the fact, you know, that there's so many different concepts of justice for so many different people. For those families who have disappeared, it might be the most temporary, I mean, the, the most immediate thing to find where their loved ones are. For refugees, it might be to, um, you know, to return. And that might mean compromises that other actors, other legitimate, independent, objective civil, Syrian civil society actors might reject. How could you reconcile in order to return? Or how could you jeopardize uh, you know, uh, trials in order to find your son, and 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 uh, but but and there's no wrong and right answer in these situations, and and I think the Syrian civil society um, that is kind of born out of the Syrian uprising, and you really needs to create that culture where I can share my thoughts and Sima and Salma and everyone, um, you know, within the Sy Syrian civil society sphere to say, you know, I think these prosecutions are useful. Others might say, might have a different views uh, about them that they're raising expectations. Some think victims organizations are excellent in, in preserving the truth. Others think it might ma make it more difficult, you know, for them to be able to take a step back and, 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 and concede. So I really believe that in order to be able to kind of capitalize on all the documentation efforts, we need to understand that we need to put more work and not less work, notwithstanding that it's been so documented. We need to strategize how we're going to use that documentation understanding the difficulties that, that, that are attached to that, and also create an internal Syrian safe space that allows us to reflect without, you know, uh, uh, raising, you know, the treason card, or, you know, you're lowering the boundaries, or, you know, you're high, you're kind of sitting in your ivory tower and all of that, or perhaps if having these accusations maybe in a closed room, but knowing that everyone 
is with you know the heart is in the right place trying to get some sort of justice or at least working towards justice uh, uh, um, together. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim, for, and for all our panelists and for the participants who already put some very interesting questions. So uh, I'm going to put uh, some of these questions to the panelists and while we receive uh, more of these. So I'm going to start with two uh, questions that probably uh, to the to the whole panel from Dima uh, Norman from FCDO. Uh, she has two questions. First, she says the report deduces that many activists uh, believe that a political transition is an important prerequisite to pre uh, um, prerequisite for pursuing transitional justice in Syria. However, as the prospect for such transition continue to fade, what are the chances of achieving justice in Syria? Second question from her is that your report also points towards growing recognition among Syrian civil society groups for the need of, uh, to align their documentation activities more closely with the needs and priorities of victims and affected communities. Uh, so would this, in your view, help to reduce the level of politicization, uh, politicization <clears throat> in the documentation uh, space. Uh, I have also two other specific questions, one to Ruti and the other one I think is more for Ibrahim. So the first one from Jess Keating to Professor Ruti is, you mentioned the concept of sustainable justice. Would you consider the position peace before justice uh, is one that runs contrary to this concept? And from your expertise in such statement, peace before justice, uh, 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 one that stands up the test of time or one that makes matter worse. Uh, we also have a question from Yaman Marrawi, which I think Brahim, uh, because of his involvement in this case, will probably be able to answer is, on the Netherlands and the fact that the Netherlands has recently uh, notified Syria of its intention to hold the Assad regime under the United Nations Convention Against Torture. Uh, what should we make of this and what should we expect in the future? So um, who wants to start on the first two questions? Yavor and Sima, do you, uh, do you want to answer? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Rim. I'll just take the first question on the chances for justice without uh, sort of political transition. My instinct is that, um, as in other contexts, uh, the the sort of the the expect as the expectation becomes frustrated, the thinking shifts in other ways. Uh, some of the thinking that that we were able to see in our research suggests that some activists are thinking actually about justice as a way of contributing to or, or even jumpstarting uh, transition and uh, particularly I think those who work on accountability. Uh, others I think are recognizing the fact that uh, there are multiple goals in justice and, and particularly the victim-centered approach to justice. I think whatever kind of outcome ends up emerging, these issues about the conflict being about land transfer and, and property transfer at the local level the potential for, for sort of conflict going forward in any kind of transition, whether it's predicated on, you know, partial temporary uh, sort of freeze or, or, or partial victory. Um, I think these questions never go away. And, and, uh, and so uh, in, in that sense, um, I think that the, uh, the sort of the absence of political transition is, is not necessarily uh, sort of uh, stopping uh, Syrian groups and, and international actors as well, but it's, it is challenging them to think about it in a different way uh, and to think about the role of, of documentation in potentially catalyzing uh, forms of justice that can coexist with absence of transition or forms of justice that can precipitate or contribute to political transition. Uh, thank you, Yavor. Um, Sima and Selma, would you like to add? Sure, if I may. Um, I think, you know, what Yavor is saying is, uh, is right. And I think it's a shift from, think, you know, thinking about national processes to thinking what are the opportunities um, that are available now, um, whether they're, you know, on the margins, um, whether they're outside uh, in, in, you know, in outside of Syria in terms of the 
um, cases that are being prosecuted outside or whether it is, you know, working with communities and particular victims groups to, um, you know, to, to, to um, elevate their voices, support them to, to, um, to, to get their demands. I think it's a shift in terms of um, also going, you know, to, to thinking what can we do for, to build uh, capacity networks um, and to take advantage of whatever opportunities there are to um, to achieve justice or to build towards a, a justice later. And another, I think another one that's important is the issue of memorialization and documentation. And uh, that is another space where um, I think justice and, you know, and truth telling is being, you know, contested and it's an important space where, Syri you know, Syrians can still um, at least uh, fight to have their, 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 their truth uh, acknowledged, what happened to them, their experiences. Um, and so I think this is one space where Syrians are, and Syrian civil society is trying to um, also pursue justice um, and, and truth telling. Um, yeah. Thank you, Salma. Uh, Brahim on the question of the Netherlands. Sure. So I think um, any kind of effort that needs that that could contribute to or takes us towards justice in the fight of, against impunity is um, is something that that is great. I think the Netherlands initiative um, has a couple of quick benefits. It takes the situation from just Syria to the international, it takes torture from Syria to the international community. It puts it in front, eventually, if it does get to the court, in front of uh, uh, 15 international judges. Um, it makes it difficult to return refugees to Syria where they could be, be, be tortured. Um, it, it sends a message that these crimes will not be condoned. It gives an, a, the ability, a platform for evidence to be presented in front of the, the UN's most senior uh, uh, court. Um, you know, it, at a time where, you know, things are kind of calming down militarily, it's making clear that the, the situation in Syria is not just about the military, but crimes were committed. So there is a lot that could come out of it. But of course, we have to see it within the, the wider kind of context and manage expectations. It will not be the full kind of prospect of justice. It will not, you know, end the crimes they're currently committing, but it's definitely a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Ruti, there was this question directed to you. And I'm, I'm going to put another question also slightly related to you uh, that came from Hugo Goodridge says, uh, what conflicts from history that have witnessed a resolution uh, could be used as a blueprint for Syria to work from? Thank you. Uh, both great questions. And obviously, we don't have several hours to, <laughs> to review all, all prior conflict resolution. But uh, I, I, I want to say that the often peace and justice, uh, that binary is overdone. And that uh, what we see uh, when you look uh, historically is that and I believe, uh, you know, the jurist, uh, late Sharif Basuni wrote about this in the context of, of conflict resolution. And he was involved in documenting uh, conflict, uh, the offenses uh, in the Balkans and uh, also South Africa. And, and, and it really what he highlighted uh, is, and he would have loved to be involved in this, in this panel, uh, uh, was the importance uh, of justice for sustain what I call, you know, and he did sustainable peace. And that is that you can say, well, well, let's sacrifice justice for peace now and just say, well, forget about the offenses and forget about redress. But what history has shown is that one does so at, at, at one's peril and that you need uh, accountability and rule of law for people, you know, in society to feel safe to return, right? Uh, you need accountability and rule of law to exclude perpetrators uh, past perpetrators from future political positions and um, and 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 for the societies generally security for the society so these tend to be overly dichotomized and uh, and and what Basuni wrote about uh, was the way uh, justice ordinary justice is implied in peace and, and you know in established democracies we don't think we're going to, you know that we have to give up 
you know, justice for peace. And we think that, that, you know, even if it's under enforced, having a certain, you know, having courts, having possibility of litigation, having peaceful forms of conflict resolution, we think of that as, as intimately connected to, to peace, that justice is connected to peace. So I, I just want to say that. And I think that in terms of examples, and this connects, uh, you know, the peace justice question to the second question, um, if we think of South Africa, uh, the, the way justice was a very important part of the, of the deal uh, with the ANC. If we think of, uh, of Northern, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, um, and we think of Colombia and in the Havana Acuerdo, the Havana Agreement with, with the FARC, all of these involved uh, difficult trade-offs, right? Uh, that in order to be able to get the various, uh, you know, warring factions at the table, there had to be certain uh, agreements that connect, that related to justice and connected justice and the peace. That doesn't mean it's a blueprint for Syria in the sense that, you know, with Northern Ireland, uh, there were amnesties for those who were already on, in the criminal justice system. With Colombia and the FARC, what's exciting is that even with the current ICC, you know, uh, uh, monitoring and so forth, that they were able to come up with an agreement to alternative sanctions with an eye to the future, with to depoliticize, demilitarizing the FARC and making them part of the political process and the importance of land restitution and the importance of other agreements and it's very much victim centered so i would invite uh, some of them uh, those who are working on Syria to take a look at the uh, at the Havana agreement precisely because like the the concerns in Syria it has uh, you know it involves uh, the concern for four pillars it involves the concern for accountability for perpetrators but also is very much victim centered it has the truth commission and truth in the uh, special jurisdiction for peace and it and it's very concerned with reparatory justice going forward. I hope that was some way towards answering the question. Yes, great. Thank you very much, Eroti. I'm, I'm going to go back to Yavor and Sima. There are some questions that are as, uh, especially um, directed to you. So the first, we have one from Christine Cheng from the War Studies at, at King's College. Uh, she says, are there regional differences in your findings regarding collecting documentations, for example, northeast Syria or northwest versus the Syrian government controlled areas? For example, should expect uh, that collecting uh, data from uh, the Assad areas to be uh, more difficult? Yavor, would you, uh, do you have an answer or Sima? I mean, I guess Sima could give more details okay. than that. Well, I would just say that um, that the the, work, the documentation work that actually takes place on the ground is often driven, like in every conflict, by the opportunities to do that documentation work. And and a lot of our respondents, for example, highlighted how when when uh, control over territory changes hands, as it has done in so many parts of Syria repeatedly. Uh, or, uh, you know, pursuant to um, uh, sort of agreements, local agreements between uh, various uh, factions. Um, the, the sort of, the, the situation is incredibly fluid and dynamic. At the same time, what new technologies have allowed, I think, to do is that they've really created a transnational community of documentation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people uh, are, are using their private uh, relationships uh, in the diaspora. A lot of the human rights uh, activists are outside of Syria, but retain very strong links uh, on, on the ground. And so I think the geography of, 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 of documentation is uh, incredibly sort of dynamic and, and fragmented locally, but it's also incredibly transnational. And I think that's a very interesting uh, and, and, and sort of significant development. Okay, thank you. Yavor, why are we here? There is another question maybe you can answer from Sultan uh, Kogalan. He says, do you think uh, there would be peace to come uh, into Syria in the long term? Uh, it is such crisis with many external actors involved in it. Uh, when the topic uh, is the Middle East, uh, thinking peace is really hard and far away. On the other hand, in the past, many documents collect collected about atrocities, ethnic cleansings, or forced displacement in many other countries in the region but no officials were punished. 
think I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't sort of uh, uh, dare to uh, answer the question of whether or not peace will emerge. I, I think the question is what kind of settlement may emerge eventually. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of the questions uh, that, that sort of, uh, as Rudy pointed out, that center on this dichotomy uh, seem to neglect the fact that in most contemporary conflicts, there are very rarely uh, clear-cut endings. Uh, conflict recurrence, conflict persistence is uh, a characteristic of, of, of these conflicts. And even where the violence uh, ends, uh, it seems to be more a freezing of, a, of, a, of the conflict uh, and then the potential to reignite uh, at any moment. And I think that is the challenge for documentation and for, and for transitional justice, is to think about situation where Syria may be for a long time in a gray zone between conflict and, and peace. And even if there is some kind of settlement with some movement towards democratization, again, the evidence is that post-conflict states are also in a gray zone between dictatorship uh, and, and democracy. Uh, and so it is, it is thinking about the role of documentation, the significance of documentation for justice that can coexist with this gray zone scenario, but also justice, forms of justice, forms of documentation that potentially might offer a direction, uh, a, a sort of a way of, of nudging things uh, away from, uh, from, from conflict and, and, and in, a, in a direction of, uh, of, of travel, at least, that is, that is towards peace. Thank you, Yavor. Uh, Ibrahim, there are two questions uh, directed to you. One from Professor Omit Ongur uh, from University of Amsterdam. Um, he's saying 2020 and 2021 mark the years that a large number of Syrians will get German, Dutch, Swedish, etc. citizenships. What effect will that have on transitional justice for the survivors, but also for the uh, perpetrators who uh, will ac acquire European passports? There is another question to you also um, uh, from uh, uh, Christine Cheng from More Studies and Kings. Uh, she says, I also really appreciated your uh, frank comments, uh, Brahim. Uh, the safe space for victims is always difficult to negotiate in war to peace transition and having the conversation uh, in a, an honest way is even more challenging. So that was more like a comment. So, Brahim. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, th thanks, Reem. Um, to, to Professor Omid's question, I mean, thinking on top of my head, I, I see a couple of clear direct benefits. Obviously the kind of ju court jurisdictional matter would depend on each country and what their laws say, but given that these crimes were committed at a time where they were not citizens, I would be surprised if, if you know, anything changes from that perspective, given that the courts may already have jurisdiction by virtue of them being present. However, the direct benefits in my opinion are, first, given when they get citizenship, they get stability, so they're able to speak out more. So I would suspect that we get a lot of more victims that are not of being afraid of being deported, they're not afraid of getting rid of their settled status, and so they're able to speak out more uh, um, and, and share their experiences. And two, I see their ability to pressure their policymakers a bit more because now they're voting constituents. So um, that would also, you know, they're now part of the, the, the system and so might, might be able to push the politicians to do uh, a little bit more on uh, on transition. So those are the kind of two main things that you know uh, come to mind. Obviously, something else that that has a big impact is uh, you know when it comes to accountability and uh, and truth telling is something that a lot of Syrians suffered from is the ability to travel. You know, we can't get to New York, you can't get to Geneva. Your uh, travel document does not let you go and meet uh, victims in regional countries, and if they do, you cannot bring them there and stuff like that. So having a passport, I think, would amplify the ability of you know, activists and people and, and victims and survivors to travel, roam the world visa-free uh, in order to be able to, I mean, after Corona, obviously, to be able to you know, get their views uh, uh, across in a more meaningful way. And on the, um, on the space, absolutely. And I think it's not just the space and the difficult conversation, it's the ability to take away Syrian pride, which is also a very imp almost impossible task, to say, I was wrong in 2019 to say we shouldn't have done this, now I think it's the right thing. Or for me to say something in 2020 that I believe, you know, this approach is the best thing, then backtrack and say, no, actually, this wasn't the correct thing, without anyone saying, ah, look, you didn't strategize properly, your, your thoughts changed, you're, you're inconsistent, and all of that. And if I have that fear, I will not be able to voice my concerns 
uh, uh, properly. And so it's not just the conversation, it's, it's also what happens after the conversation and the ability to reflect and, uh, and say, I was, I was wrong. Because, we, I mean, we're always used to saying I was right. Lovely. Thank you very much, Brahim. I'm going to move to uh, Selma. Selma, I have two questions to you. The first is a bit difficult. Uh, it's short. It says, is there a hope for democracy in Syria? And if not, uh, what comes next? Uh, the second question is on the role of media from George Hill. And he says, in your experience, uh, how do visual forms of documentation compare to oral linguistic forms in capturing the international attention, especially across uh, cultural boundaries? It is a difficult question um, because I think, you know, uh, every year, every development, we think something is going to happen. I mean, uh, before the Russian intervention, did we think, you know, this would happen after the Russian intervention, thought maybe this would be over, the regime would win, but maybe the war would be over. Then now we're in a stalemate, I think, where the war is frozen. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I, it's very difficult for me to tell. I think in terms of, um, is there hope for democracy? Yes. Uh, is it coming soon? Probably not. Um, it's a ways away. Um, it doesn't mean we don't, you know, I think a lot of the actors that were involved in the revolution are probably not the same people who will, who are going to be, you know, there's be new people carrying the torch. It'll be a different, maybe a different way of doing things. It'll be a uh, different messaging in different circumstances. What we can do um, is to um, support uh, in different ways, uh, whether it's documenting what happened and making sure that that is part of the conversation and the memory so that we don't, again, lose that history that we've lost, whether from Hema or other, you know, we need to keep that uh, memory alive and the truth of what has happened. Um, the lessons from what has happened, uh, the the um, the skills that we've learned, and think about how we can pass them on to uh, activists, to communities inside Syria, and and in you know, and those who have been displaced outside as well, inside and outside, and and to support um, you know the possibility of organizing, talking, um, um, collaborating and taking advantage of what opportunities there are in order for new movements and new um, and new actors to push for democracy um, going forward. So it's a long, it's a long process. Um, and you know, our roles will shift and we look at how we can, uh, how we can be of use. And I like to say, it's not just about hope, it's about a commitment and, 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 and love for the people and for the country. And, and even if we're hopeless, sometimes we continue to fight for it um, and for those people. And um, how do we keep that memory alive? Part of that is through, you know, the second question on, um, you know, visual media and the role of visual media. I think that there's different ways in which that has um, that has played a part um, first, you know, in, 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 in capturing moments, in, in capturing um, where we were and where we are going. I think, you know, whether it's looking at posters, for instance, the work that Creative Memory has done in documenting the art, the posters um, related to the conflict and where we are as a, um, where we have been as um, activists and as a revolution, the progression of that or in terms of how we then tell the story of what happened. I think oral histories are, um, uh, uh, are very important or storytelling is very important, whether that is even the families. I, I think there was a marked difference in terms, of, you know, in terms of whether you read a report about detention and hear about, yes, 100,000, and between he hearing the story of a mother that still cooks this meal because her child, she, you know, that was the meal she made when she was expecting him to come home and he never did. And, you know, and, and those stories, um, whether, you know, it's individuals telling them and, and um, through testimonials and, um, or whether we capture them and we capture the human impact of the conflict and the violence um, through storytelling, you know, through, through, through media, uh, uh, movies, um, you know, they, they have an impact in terms of really 
bringing home the, 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 the scale of the conflict and of the violations of, of making it, of touching people and, and, and spurring them to action. And, and I think they, they are where we can speak to stories that we wouldn't, or, or violations that we wouldn't otherwise um, want to talk about. For instance, issues like sexual violence or otherwise things that have been taboo, um, you know, media, visual, um, you know, uh, different, different ways of storytelling can, are important, not just to memorialize an issue, but to also bring to light issues that, that, that are underrepresented and under Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Selma. Uh, I'm moving to Sima now. We have two questions to Sima. Uh, the first one, I'll go back to the previous question about whether you observed any differences in the documentation between the different parts uh, in Syria. Uh, and also there is a question that came from Zaki Mehchi on the coordination between different civil society organizations on documentation. Is there enough coordination? And if not, what can be done to improve it. Uh, Sima, and if you want to answer in Arabic, I'm happy to translate. Shukran, Reem. I'm going to ask you to ask me in Arabic. And thank you very much for your question. The first question is, in terms of the development of the development, I think there are difficulties. Always the development is not a possibility for the أصحاب السلطة فبمناطق النظام أكيد هو ما رح يرحب بالأشخاص اللي بيوثقوا ضده الانتهاكات اللي بيرتكبها هو بالمقابل ما كانت كثير في فرق بالمناطق الثانية لا بمناطق سيطرة قوات سوريا الديمقراطية ولا بمناطق سيطرة الجيش الحر ولا الوطني ولا النصرة ولا أكيد الكل يعني نحن واجهنا نفس الصعوبات بكل المحلات هلا التحدي كان الكبير إنه مع كل تغير بخارطة الصراع إنه نرجع نبني فريق جديد وندرب فريق جديد ونضمن انه هذا هذا يعني هو اصعب شيء انه نضمن هذا الشخص عنده مصداقيه او هو ما انه متحيز للجهه المسيطره مثلا او هلا في صعوبات بهذا الخصوص يعني ف يعني للاسف دائما بنخسر بشكل متواصل الباحثين تبعونا لانه بس تسيطرت يعني بس خضعت منطقه لسيطره حدا ثاني بيضطر هذا هيدول الاشخاص انه يقطعوا التواصل او ينتقلوا لمكان ثاني فهيدا فهيدا للاسف تحدي كثير كبير بمناطق الشرق الفولات بشكل خاص يعني في في يعني هيك خليني اقول ايحاء بانه في جو من الديمقراطيه موجود وانه في مسموح لمنظمات المجتمع المدني تشتغل بحريه بس حقيقه لا لما بيكون في في انتهاكات مرتكبه من قبل هذه السلطات المنظمات المجتمع المدني ما بتقدر تحكي على العنن اللي موجوده هي ما بتقدر تحكي عن العنن بتنسق مع منظمات برا برا هي المناطق لتحكي عن هي الانتهاكات، فهن بيتعاملوا بهذا الاطار، بيعطونا ممكن معلومات لانه نحن ما نتواجد هنيك مثلا لحتى نحن نحكي بدالهم، ف خليني اقول قمع عمليه التوثيق هو موجود دائما بكل بكل المناطق. بخصوص السؤال الثاني يمكن جاوبت على جزء منه هو مثلا بهيك بهيك موقف بصير في نوع من التنسيق بين المنظمات الثانيه بس اجمالا في يعني في حد ادنى من التنسيق بين المنظمات بس كمان برجع ما بدي بين انه انا بتحيز المنظمات النسويه بس فعلا المنظمات النسويه بسهوله بتلاقي التشبيك بين بعضهم اسهل نعمل مشاريع مع بعض بيطلع اسهل بكثير ما بيكون في كثير يعني دائما في عندنا شوي نظره يعني وحده فبتحسي انه الاسهل بين بعض المنظمات الصغيرة كمان سهل بين بعض أنه ينسقوا من المنظمات شوي كبيرة بيكون الإيجو عندهم شوي عالي فما بيتناسب ينسقوا مع حدا ففي بس أكيد في يعني حد أدنى من التنسيق بين المنظمات في حد معقول يعني okay. Thank you, Sima. So I'm going to translate uh, on the differences between different areas. Sima says, uh, well, when it comes to document, documenting human rights abuses, all authorities, all authorities don't like this and they always resist, this, uh, resist it. Uh, and this applies to all different regions in Syria. Uh, so she haven't seen real differences between the area controlled by the Syrian government 
or uh, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces or the Free Syrian Army or uh, SGS, the Al Qaeda Associated Organization. They all don't like and don't welcome documentation. Um, uh, she said, even in the uh, SDF areas that give the impression that they are pro democracy, pro civil society, actually, the reality we've seen when it comes to documentation uh, of human rights abuses is, is completely different from uh, uh, that beautiful image. Uh, the reality is that when they commit uh, uh, violations and human rights organizations in their areas don't have enough space to speak out and to, to call them on it. So what they do is that they coordinate with the organizations that are based abroad, like Siemens organization, and they report these violations to them, and then those abroad would be able uh, uh, to speak out. Uh, Sima says the challenge, the biggest challenge that this geographical division of Syria brings is the con the fact that it always changes and one area is captured for, by different authorities so every time they have to create a new team you know they cre create a team on the ground they have their networks they train them and then suddenly this area is captured by another authority so they all have to wrap up and relocate to another area so you have to create a new team in this uh, uh, area and that's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges on the issue of coordination, as the example that Sima brought about, for example, working with those on the ground and those abroad, can tell you that there is coordination. And overall, she says, there is a minimal level of coordination, but maybe not enough. But what she highlighted is that actually, particularly among the women-led organization and the feminist organization, the coordination seems to be much higher and much easier. So she says, even when we run projects together, they just run smoother. And uh, we find that we have, uh, our visions are closer uh, 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 to each other. She also says that in general, coordinating between um, small organizations seems to be much easier and smoother than coordinating with the uh, very large organizations. Thank you very much, Sima. So we don't have a lot of time left. There is just one last question I'm gonna put uh, uh, to you speakers, which is about the Biden. What do you expect uh, uh, now from the upcoming Biden administration? And there's any hope uh, 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 for effectiveness of cons uh, the constitutional committee? I don't know who wants to answer that. Well, I can say something as the, probably yes, the token please. American in the, yes. uh, in the group, but the, this is in the area of crystal balls, reading the uh, tea leaves. Um, well, I, I mean, one uh, thought, uh, obviously, is that, I mean, the first would be that the Biden administration transition team has already uh, uh, been making noises about being multilateral and not America first. And, uh, and uh, Biden has already said that he's gonna rejoin the Paris Pact. I mean, there are about 12 treaties that, uh, that um, the Trump administration pulled out of, uh, and, and you know, including the World Health Organization and you know, including environmental. So that's the general uh, approach. And I think that that already is very welcome, this uh, multilateral and more cooperative uh, approach. And it's obviously what is needed in, in global times. And we know that, um, you know, that the uh, Syrian conflict involves is international. And so, you know, that's an approach that is appropriate for that uh, conflict. The, uh, the other thing is, it's important to recall that uh, Biden worked with in the Obama administration and Obama had uh, enunciated a red line regarding Syria, right? The famous line about chemical, the use of chemical weapons. And, and, and it was considered, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a difficult uh, and bad moment uh, when, when there wasn't the, you know, intervention when chemical weapons were used. So, you know, again, that doesn't mean that the, that the intervention can, you know, will be, you know, uh, uh, military in nature, but it does mean that there was a concern about the normativity, about these, uh, uh, these atrocious offenses that have tra transnational implications. And he was part of that administration. And, and so, you know, that's something to think about, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, any of the other panelists would like to add something? Um, I think the fact that um, in Obama's book he he called you know, or mentioned that Syria was was a mistake of his uh, that actually gives the opportunity for, for Joe to fix things if if he if he wants to right. <laughs> 
um, and because he was he was VP during during that time. But I, I think he has a lot of other priorities at the moment um, that would not keep Syria up on the on the kind of uh, on the agenda. Uh, is, is is my feeling, um, and so I think I think we're in for a long stalemate uh, on on things. Um, so I, I'm not hopeful for any kind of drastic uh, change in in policy at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Um, uh, any other panelists would like to come before we close down? I think I, I agree with Ibrahim that there's many other priorities, and I don't think the only thing I would say is I hope that the United States can um, regain some sort of or have some sort of leadership on human rights and democracy. I think that's all we can ask for, as opposed to at this point, any intervention as a bare minimum is is to not be speaking at the Security Council with a Security Council member that is jailing children. So I think, uh, or or putting children in cages. So I think, and you know, any moral leadership uh, on human rights uh, would be welcome. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Selma. I mean, with this, we come to the end of our event. Thank you very much for everyone who stayed with us until now and for all the questions you posted. I'm really sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions. Please feel free to contact us if you have specific questions and I'll be happy to direct your questions to uh, the panelists uh, through emails. Uh, big thank you to all our panelists for the presentation and for all what you do. Uh, uh, for justice in Syria and worldwide. Thank you so much, Sima and Yavor, for great work. I know how much time that took from you. Uh, I attended many of the meetings. I enjoyed translating uh, the conversation. That is very valuable, and I hope it's going to make a mark uh, in, in the uh, process of transitional justice in Syria. Thank you all, and hope to see you in future events. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.